Hi, my name is Callie Chappelle, and welcome to this video that is the role of EFT and GTP in bringing an amino acyl tRNA to the ribosome and peptidyl transfer. That title is a mouthful, but I'm going to explain it all. This video is made for MCDB 427, which is molecular biology at the University of Michigan. Now, before we jump in, what I want to do is explain all the details about what we know is going on in this entire process. Now, we're gonna after after I explain this, we're gonna step back and do and, and look at a very a much more basic study that tells us some very basic things about this. But I find it's really helpful to understand kind of the larger process and then be able to fit in how this research um, how this research fits in with that. So. First, we're looking at the elongation of translation, and the first thing that happens is association between EFTU and GTP. And after EFTU and GTP are associated, um, it then uh, associates with an amino acyl tRNA to form this ternary complex that combines all three. Then that associates with the 70S uh, ribosomal complex that already has a tRNA here in the P site. This comes from the initiation of translation step um, that you've probably already studied if you're watching this video. Um, that already has the mRNA, this tRNA, and the P site, and then the 70S, and then the 70S uh, ribosomal subunits. And together, this this ternary complex comes into the A site. Um, then this GTP gets hydrolyzed, and that allows uh, EFTU to be released. EFTS uh, kind of recharges EFTU with GTP. Um, but but what results in what results is we have now a uh, we have now a ribosome that has an a tRNA that's charged in both the P and the A site, so peptide trans uh, so a peptide transfer reaction can occur. A peptidyl transfer reaction can then occur. So here's a disclaimer. So so if that was went right over your head. Don't worry about it. I just wanted to give you an idea of where we're going. But in this experiment, it was so basic they actually didn't even know that EFTU and EFTS were two separate proteins. All they knew is that there was something called EFT that somehow influences amino acyl tRNAs being brought into this ribosomal complex. So we actually can't make conclusions about EFTU or EFTS. We can't actually know a lot of the things that I just told you based on this experiment. And I'm going to be really clear about what we can conclude from this experiment. I just think it's interesting to um, be able to contextualize this in like a larger process. So let's talk more about the details of this experiment. The first, uh, well, there are two big questions. The first is, what is the role of EFT and GTP, or its non-hydrolyzable analog, GDPCP, in delivering tRNA to the ribosome? So what, what does it have to do with bringing this guy into the ribosome. And the second question is, is GTP hydrolysis necessary for either the deliverance of this tRNA or of this tRNA, this amino acyl tRNA? So, um, actually we'll get there. Or peptidyl transfer, the peptidyl transfer reaction. So in order to answer these questions, we have to do the experiment, and I will go over the methods with you now. The first thing we do is add a bunch of stuff together. The first is salt-washed ribosomes. Remember, they're salt-washed because we want to remove any factors that are associated with them. Um, so we can add back just the ones that we're interested in looking at. We will add or not add EFT. And remember, EFT includes EFTU and EFTS. We will add or not add GTP or GDPCP. Remember, that's the non-hydrolyzable GTP. Then we will add tritiated phenylalanine tRNA phenylalanine, which is an amino acyl tRNA, amino acylated tRNA, which I've drawn here. And we will add 14C N-acetyl phi tRNA phi. So this is a tRNA that mimics being charged with a dipeptide. After we add these things together and it does its thing, then we'll isolate ribosomal pellet. We'll isolate ribosomal pellets. So we'll see. So what we're seeing is what's on the ribosome. We'll extract anything that's bound to that ribosome. We'll separate the things that were bound to the ribosome using paper chromatography, and then we'll quantify the radioactivity of those things that were bound. Now, the inputs and the products can be distinguished because they migrate differently because they're different sizes, and they also have different radioisotope combinations. So remember, the two inputs, this input, here, I'll just come over here. So here I've redrawn this as a table. So we've got two inputs, remember, this n acetyl phi tRNA phi. So this is the tRNA that is mimicking being charged with a dipeptide, and this is labeled as 14C. And then our other input is this phi tRNA phi, and um, this is labeled with tritium. So when we have our product, our product is going to be labeled with both 14C and 3 ion tritium, which is shown here. And that we can also distinguish um, after doing paper chromatography because it has both of these isotopes. Now, how is this product formed? Well, here first we will start out with, and this is not actually something that you can, you can infer steps of this from this data, but I just want to show you so you have some kind of visual representation of what's going on so you can better understand in your mind. 
So remember that when this whole thing starts out, when we're going to be bringing in the 70s uh, ribosomal complex from the initiation of translation. So remember this tRNA um, that he's shown here as as being charged with a dipeptide is already on there. So so that I'm just kind of getting this from I'm trying to get I'm getting this from what I drew over here. So we have our dipeptide in the P site, and then a peptidyl tRNA will bind in the A site. And so the first question this the, this research asks is is can this bind? Can this peptidyl tRNA bind to the ribosome? And then the second question is um, so so the next thing that would happen is once it's bound to the A site, once this peptidyl tRNA is bound to the A site, peptidyl transfer occurs that transfers this dipeptide onto this amino acid. Um, to this tRNA that's in the that's in, in the A site, and then the question that this research asks is: Is GTP or GDPCP and EFT necessary in order for this to happen? In order for, in other words, in order for the product to be formed. Product formed. So now that we have the setup, let's actually see what the results are. So I'm going to go over. So we've got row one, two, and three, and I'll go over each one in turn. So now you understand well how this product is formed. Now you can't infer all the things I just told you, especially with rel with uh, with regards to the sites, because all we're looking at is 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 it on the uh, ribosome or is it not? It doesn't say. We have no information about where it's binding. But this is just like what's going on. So you have a so you have some context to understand this. So row one, we have not added EFT or GTP or or GDPCP, and we're asking what binds. So with um, so first, we see the peptidyl tRNA bind. So this peptidyl tRNA is the one that's charged with the dipeptide, with a dipeptide analog bind. But phi tRNA does not seem to bind. Um, the second thing that we note is that no product is formed. And this is no surprise because we're missing the binding of one of the reactants, this phi tRNA phi. So this can bind without EFT and GTP. Row 2, what do we know? So now we have the, we've added EFT and GDP. And the first thing we notice is that the input phi tRNA phi can bind. And we already know that the input uh, N acetyl phi tRNA phi can bind without EFT, so it's no surprise that it still binds when EFT and GDP is added. This means that we can create our product here, this N acetyl di phi tRNA phi, via peptidyl transfer. So, so peptidyl transfer, peptidyl transfer PT can happen here because that's the only way that we can form this product. So we see an increase in our product from when we have added nothing from now when we add EFT to GDP. And this is corroborated by a drop in acetyl phi tRNA phi. And this drop is because the reactant is being turned into a product. Um, but it, it's not because there's less acetyl phi tRNA phi binding. And we know that because we see an increase in our product. And it has that increase in product has to come from somewhere. It's coming from uh, using up of the binding of N-acetyl phi tRNA phi, and also uh, the fact that phi tRNA phi can actually bind in the first place. Now let's look at row three. So in row three, we've added EFT, and then we've added GDPCP, which is the non-hydrolyzable. I'm I know I'm writing this every single time, but everybody seems to forget what it does. Analog of GTP. And let's see what happens when we use this non-hydrolyzable analog of GDP, which is GDPCP. So first, we see a similar level of N-acetyl phi, tRNA phi binding as in the previous two, especially in row one, remember when we didn't add anything. And this corroborates that neither GTP, GDPCP, nor EFT is necessary for binding of N-acetyl phi, tRNA phi. The second thing is with regards to phi, tRNA phi, you get binding with EFT, with GDP, CP, and EFT, which indicates that GDP hydrolysis is not necessary for this stuff to happen because GDP hydrolysis can't happen with GDP, CP, right? So it can bind without GDP hydrolysis. As, fact, as far as EFT is concerned, GDP, CP is the same as GDP for the delivery of this feed tRNA to the ribosome. That's the conclusion. Now, you can't conclude what I'm about to say next from this data, but this is still something that is interesting. So GTP or GDPCP is necessary to get phi tRNA binding, but EFT alone, uh, EFT alone or EFT and GDP would not result in this binding. So GTP or GDPCP is necessary, but EFT, even though it doesn't show in this data, EFT alone or EFT and GDP would not be sufficient for this to bind.
you can't came for, you can't say that from the data. All you can say is that GDP hydrolysis is not necessary for this step for this to bind. All right. What's the third conclusion? So we've successfully gotten our two reactants, this guy and this guy, onto the ribosome, our two inputs onto the ribosome. So the next question is, will a product be formed? And you can see here that the product that with GDPCP, non-hydrolyzable GDP, no product is formed. This indicates that the hydrolysis of GDP must be key to form this product, this n acetyl diphe tRNA phi. And that is all we conclude from this data. Now what I'm going to explain next is what's really going on. But you can't conclude what I'm about to say to you from this data. Other work shows, a, shows this information about the mechanism. And the mechanism is that EFTU has to be released, which is mediated by GDP hydrolysis. This is what I showed you at the very beginning of this video. So um, EFTU release is mediated by GDP turning into GDP, which is hi GDP hydrolysis. And then peptidyl transfer can happen. And which is what produces that N acetyl phi tRNA phi. That's what I've drawn here. This, this peptidyl transfer can happen once EFTU has left. But you cannot conclude that. I just wanted to explain if you're, if you're seeing this data and you're just, you're, you're wondering like me, well, why is that? That's why. So I hope this video is helpful. I try to really clearly outline what you could and could not infer from this data. If you have any questions, feel free to comment.